We will continue our 2023 positional review this week with the defensive line and linebackers on the Wandering Buffalo podcast. You're now listening to the Wandering Buffalo podcast with your host, Justin Goddard. Bills Mafia, welcome into another episode of the Wandering Buffalo podcast, a show brought to you by the Buffalo Fanbase Podcast Network. My name is Justin. I will be your host today. And this show is brought to you by 26 Shirts. Um, If you haven't checked out 26 Shirts yet, I know we've been talking about them for a while here. Uh, Just awesome shirts, awesome causes in the community. Um, They are founded by um, Del Reed. Many of you probably saw his name pop up this year. He was a finalist for the NFL uh, Fan of the Year. So, you know... Everything that goes with being even nominated for that award is is what this company represents. So make sure you're checking them out. Give them some support so they can keep doing the work that they're doing in the community. Uh, today, we are talking about the defensive line as a whole, right? So defensive end, defensive tackle. And we're going to talk about the linebackers in the second segment. Um, I wanted to do these two groups together because they're... There's so far on the other ends of the spectrum of one group in the linebackers being pretty, pretty well set for this coming season and the defensive line as a whole, uh, just and not even really knowing what to do with it at this point. Um, so we're going to start out with the defensive line, just going to kind of run through all the players that we had in 2023 um, who's free agents and who we still have under contract going into the next season. Um, so defensive end, we have AJ Epinesa, free agent, um, Leonard Floyd, free agent, Kingsley, Jonathan, um, Shaq Lawson, free agent, Greg Rousseau, Von Miller, and Cameron Klein on a futures contract. Um, so for, for how many players we had, at defensive end last year that were productive. Um, Really not much coming back right now. Um, AJ Epinesa, obviously having the first chance to hit free agency and get a paycheck. Now there's a couple things going on here that I think work for the bills, but I also think work against the bills. Um, And the first thing being the salary cap going up Uh, a bigger jump than pretty much anybody in the league uh, was expecting a little bit more money to play with. Um, so that does give the bills a, a better chance of keeping some of these players around. It also means, you know, teams that already had more salary cap have even more wiggle room to give out, you know, maybe like an inflated contract. Um, I have concerns here with Epinesa. It could, I, w- I would love to have him back um, on a deal that makes sense. I feel like the production that he had was in such a limited role last year. Um, there's probably going to be at least one team out there that kind of looks at that and they're like, you know, betting on the projection. Hey, this guy was getting whatever, 30% of the snaps. If we give him 60 um, just think of what he can do type of deal. Um, I don't want to get into a bidding war over Epinesa, um, but I, I do think this is kind of similar to um, the year when we lost Shaq Lawson and Jordan Phillips both in the same year the first time, and they both kind of got overpaid in free agency somewhere in like the $10 million contracts. Um, and went elsewhere and didn't really have the same production, obviously end up coming back here, um, to kind of finish off their careers. Um, like I said, hopefully there could be a number I'm saying maybe in like the six, seven average annual value, um, a contract that makes sense for Epinesa. I would love to have him back. Um, kind of sucks having him be a second round pick and kind of taking a while to develop and bloom into the system. And then we, we see it start happening last year. Um, and then, you know, 
it looks like he's he's going to hit the market and probably go elsewhere. Um, the the one thing that I really loved about Epinesa was his past breakups. Um, just absolutely a beast with that department of just knowing, hey, I'm not going to get to the quarterback on this play. Let me get my hands up, get in a passing lane. Um, and he broke up a ton of passes. Um, moving on to Leonard Floyd, also a free agent. Um, this is also a dude that I would love to have back. I know he's kind of getting up there in age, but if last year was any indicator, um, I don't think he's shown any signs of dropping off. Um, when will it happen? Who knows? Um, gets a little bit tough with some of these aging veterans but um just over like the last four years consistently averaging in that nine nine and a half sack range um and especially with how thin we are i would love to have at least one of those two guys back um like i said this kind of falls into that same category of you know if we're just looking at football from like the bills lens like yeah it's great we have extra money that we can spend that we weren't expecting um you know brandon bean said that he was planning his off-season plans were centered around predicting about 245 um so he already kind of had some plans accounting for that cap and it goes up you know about 10 million dollars from there um so there is some more room to play with um, again, on the other side of the coin, it gives teams that have more salary cap, which is most of the league, um, some extra dollars to throw around and, you know, make themselves the most competitive offer. Uh, I don't know how large of a market there would be for Floyd right now, just with his age. Um, but when you look at other contenders like the Bills that kind of need a rotational, you know, pass rush specialist like the Bills have done. Um, if you look at maybe a team that drafts a younger guy but doesn't want him, you know, taking the first team reps to start the season, um, there's all kinds of situations that make sense for Floyd. Um, again, would love to find a, a contract that makes sense to keep him around. And you'll see that's kind of a theme for me today of, a lot of these free agents that we have, um, I would love to keep around. Uh, unfortunately, just the way the money shakes out and having to get younger and plan for the future while trying to compete, we can't keep all these guys around. Um, but those those two guys particularly, I, I would love to see back if we can find some deals that <clears throat> make sense. Uh, up next, Kingsley Jonathan. Um, he is under contract and... I, I'm good with that. I like having him around. Um, didn't play a ton of snaps last year, but we've kind of seen him just keep grinding and in the limited opportunities that he has had, we've seen him be kind of like on the fringe of disruptive, um, making some plays. He's kind of like in the backfield around the ball. Um, Kind of a great story for him. And if he's kind of moved into the the tail end of the rotation at defensive end, I'm I'm absolutely fine with that as player. Um Shaq Lawson, also a free agent. Um this is one where I, I love what Shaq Lawson has brought to the team. He's been a tremendous run defender. Um just kind of like constant pro and for me kind of sets the floor of what your defensive end room is um again kind of from the tail end of of the rotation there um if he's your fourth fifth guy coming through on rotation that's a pretty steady hand to have there um this is this is somebody that i'm willing to move on from um i love what he's brought to the team i think when you're starting to look at this roster and kind of been like the last 
two seasons or so have kind of been like the pushing the chips all in. Let's try to win a championship this year. Um, I think going into the 2024 season, we're kind of going to have to see a little bit of a shift here to, yes, we still want to compete now, but we have to start looking at how can we sustain this long term? And, and that's going to come with letting some of these aging players go and, and not giving them the next contract and getting younger and getting cheaper and starting to develop players. Um, again, trying to stay competitive now, but also be looking at how can we move forward to sustain this for the next 10 years. Um, so I, I think Shaq Lawson is a, is a guy that I let walk this year. And uh, honestly, if, if he's not going to be on the bills, what kind of market exists for him? Uh, this might be a player that, you know, we're talking about is getting awfully close to retiring. Um, so I would be looking at moving on there, um, bring in a different veteran free agent, um, move on there, find a player in the draft that you can start developing. Um, but yeah. Uh, up next, Greg Rousseau. Um, love this guy. Uh, if we're only going to have what, three, four guys in the building coming back from last year. Um, I'm glad Groot's one of them. Uh, I think he's shown steady progression and improvement um, throughout his tenure in Buffalo. And last year had a great season despite playing through a foot injury. Um, injuries have kind of been something that we've had to deal with throughout his career so far. And they've been injuries where he doesn't really miss a ton of time. Um, but you can tell he doesn't quite look like the same player um, as he's playing through these injuries. And one of the things that I love about Groot is he's kind of like that high end version of Shaq Lawson. Um, super disciplined and always where he's supposed to be in the run game. Um, and he does add a good bit of pass rush on top of that. Um, so glad he's locked up. Von Miller, just a, a real lightning rod for discussion with Von Miller. Um, obviously a very disappointing campaign in 2023. Um, and I think a lot of that is kind of self-inflicted by Von Miller. Um and it's like all this hype he created for him, like on himself, um, just in the off season, talking about he'll be ready for week one, you know, getting everybody's expectations up, and you know, being an older player coming back from an ACL, like no, no shame in taking your time getting back. Uh, I know we all got a little bit antsy with, you know, Trey White's injury of when's he when's he going to be back. Um, but he really took his time and made sure he was coming back right. And there was, you know, a little bit, couple game ramp up period for Trey White before he was starting to look like, you know, the Trey White we all know. Um, I think Von Miller rushed back. Um, uh, I think the team kind of with the assets they had invested in him didn't really try to slow him down. They wanted him on the field. Um, however, that all shook out. You know, even when he comes back week six, when you're talking about being ready week one, maybe week two, and then you do come back week six, you know, we, we were all expecting you ready for week one based on what you said. I was never expecting him week one. <laughs> um, but based on what he was saying, if you're ready to go week one in your mind, you got another five weeks on it. Like, okay, week six, week seven, we should start seeing Von Miller coming out. Um, and then it goes all throughout the season of him just uh, being a non-factor. Um, add in there some off-the-field issues and just a really disappointing season for Von. 
Um, we do see kind of finally at the end of the season, the last like couple games, he didn't really put anything in the stat sheet still, um, but he was getting close on some plays. Um, so that's that's kind of my my saving grace of hope for Von Miller. Um, but I, I do think we kind of have to adjust our expectations. Um, it looks like a terrible contract now, and it kind of is what it is at this point. It's it's the cost of doing business when you're trying to, you know, push all the chips in. And, you know, Brandon Bean felt like that game-wrecking pass rusher was what was missing. Um, and... In his first season with Buffalo, he was everything we wanted him to be. Um, he was coming up with big plays and clutch moments. He was affecting the passer. Uh, he was doing all of that. In 2024, I would just generally like to see more out of him. And I don't need him to be Von Miller of eight years ago. You know, he can still be on a little bit of a pitch count, you know, a little bit lighter in the rotation. Um, but when those clutch moments are coming up and we need a play, I need Von Miller to, to be a catalyst for that play. I don't need him getting the sack. I don't need him forcing the fumble. Um, but drawing a double team that frees up one of the defensive tackles, um, something like that. Here's the thing with Von Miller. All we can really do is hope that we get some semblance of who Von Miller was um, because with his contract, he's not going anywhere um, unless something happens with his, you know, off the field issues that ends him up on a suspension list and we can get out of that contract kind of like on a contract wording technicality. Um, other than that, he's he's much like the the Stefan Diggs contract that I've already talked about where it, it's going to cost us more for him to not be on the team um, than to be on the team. So hopefully you get something there. Hopefully it's, you know, a little bit closer to what we were getting in somewhere, at least in the middle of what we got in 2022 and what we got in 2023. Um, and then finally <clears throat> with the defensive ends, <clears throat> excuse me, we have uh, Cameron Klein on a reserve future contract. Um, he's kind of a guy that was brought into the practice squad last year that uh, I was excited for kind of his ceiling if he got anywhere near that, but that was still going to be can he supplant one of these older guys as as a rotational player? Um, so as it stands now, kind of, it's Groot and Vaughn, and the rest of the rest of that position is kind of up for grabs out there. And knowing how much this team likes to rotate, particularly on the defensive line, um. It it's really Von Groot and not much after that. Um so this this is one that I think a lot of Bill's Mafia is going to be a little bit upset about if we see an early investment in the draft. I'm talking I'm talking round one, round two. Um I know there's been so much investment in the defensive line over the tenure of brand Bean and kind of mixed results. And last year was in my opinion, by far the strongest effort. Um, but when you look at what we have here, I know wide receivers, the sexy topic right now, I know, um, you know, we all want to get the extra weapons for Josh Allen. And, and I love that idea. <clears throat> But also when you look at like what the biggest needs are um, vers versus wants, um, I do think wide receiver is a very big need for this team. I also think that this is being touted as maybe the deepest wide receiver draft ever um, from, from how much I'm hearing it 
get blown up. Um, so not only can you add talent through the draft, but also some of these veterans that are out there floating around in free agency, you know, when there's that top cream of the crop free agents that we can't afford when there's this many players coming out through the draft, there's going to be more guys than usual that are kind of waiting for cheaper deals. And we've seen Brandon Bean do a ton of like one year deals, um, wide receiver. I think you can draft a guy a, a little bit later. Uh, I feel, I still think it should be kind of a pressing need. Um, cause not only are you looking for a wide receiver too this year, you're looking for the long-term replacement for Stefan Diggs. Um, but I have a hard time sitting here today, putting wide receiver as a bigger need than defensive line. And this is before we even get into the defensive tackles. Um, so just start mentally preparing yourself for, you know, when we get to the draft, seeing some pretty significant investments in um, the D line as a whole. Uh, and we'll get into the defensive tackles um, as we come back from the break. Stick around. Hey, this is Brother Bill. Now back to the show. Welcome back in and thank you again for joining me on this week's episode of the Wandering Buffalo podcast. Uh, if you made it thus far and you have not done so yet, I do ask that you like, share, subscribe, um, tell a friend about the show, um, but mostly subscribe. Um, kind of crazy life's going on right now between myself and <clears throat> producer Jake. Um, trying to maintain that consistency, but schedules have been really crazy. Um, so just make sure you're subscribed so you're not missing any episodes. Um, we have a couple more episodes left wrapping up our review, um, should take us kind of right into free agency and the draft. Um, want to get back into it here with the defensive tackle room. And this to me looks almost identical to what we have in the defensive end room and maybe even a step down. Um, so from 2023, we have Puna Ford, free agent, Daquan Jones, free agent, Linval Joseph, free agent, Ed Oliver, under contract, uh, Tim Settles, free agent, Jordan Phillips, free agent, and Eli Anku, um, who's been kind of on and off this team for the past few years. Um, uh, and I actually want to start with Anku um, because I think he's I think he's a player that it's easy to kind of look past just because of what he's been for Buffalo. Um, he's spent a lot of time, you know, on the practice squad, getting call ups here and there and, you know, playing well in those spots and then back to the practice squad Um we saw him get released and picked up by somebody this year for a short stint. And all of a sudden that felt like a loss because he, that, that was, that was our emergency player. Um, I'm kind of curious to see if they have bigger plans for him this year and not, not that he, you know, would go to being one of the top couple guys or whatever. Um, but maybe kind of, actually on the 53 man roster and as a rotation player. Um, I think there's a path to that with all of these openings that we're going to have here. Um, so that's up next Puna Ford, um, a dude that I was absolutely psyched that we signed last year. Um, I was really excited for Puna, very disappointed with how the 2023 season went. And Puna Ford is probably the player on this team that has me scratching my head the most as I look back at 2023 um, because there were so many games that he couldn't even be active for. And then in the limited action that we did see him, I thought he played great. Um, maybe there's something I'm missing here. I'm not, you know, a, a football expert. Um, I'm not in the building every day, 
maybe there were some sort of practice habits or something like that that wasn't allowing him to get on the field. Um, I would say that I would love to have Puna Ford back. Brought him in on a pretty minimal contract. Um, and as you just heard, we don't really have much coming back. Um, he did have some comments throughout the season kind of alluding to his disappointment in usage. Um, so I think it's a pretty pretty long shot to get him back, and maybe they can convince him with, you know, we have a bigger role for you this year. Um, at the same time, I find that hard to believe when, you know, we couldn't even get the guy active on game day for most of the season. Um I would personally love to see him have another crack at it. Like I said, I, I thought in the action that he got, he he played well. Um if I'm a betting man, I don't I don't plan on Puna Ford coming back to the Bills. Um Daquan Jones obviously spent a lot of last season injured, and when he was playing, he was phenomenal. Um is there a contract out there that makes sense to bring him back? Um, I think there actually is for Daquan Jones, and I don't think it's a crazy contract. Um, <clears throat> he would be right up there um, as my kind of top priority free agent re-signing. Um, I think before his injury, he was playing absolutely out of his skin. Um, and even when he came back, he was... Not quite the same Daquan Jones, but he came back from that injury pretty quickly, um, all things considered. I think what he looked like next to Ed Oliver was awesome, and I know he's getting up there in age a little bit. The defensive tackle position ages pretty well, and we'll see that as we move into our next guy here. Um, I don't want to hand out you know, a four- or five-year contract to him, um, but... A, maybe like a two-year extension while, you know, we draft a guy and he can start developing and he's ready to go. Um, Daquan Jones, probably my number one player hitting free agency from the Bills that I want to see come back. Um, Linval Joseph, as we talk about, you know, defensive tackles aging well, um, got brought in throughout the season and came in and, I feel like was an impactful player from the rip. Um, not only did he, you know, take up a lot of space in the middle and kind of anchor it down. Um, there was plays where I, I don't have the specific games in mind, um, but the quarterback breaks the pocket and, you know, it's running towards a first down and you see Linval Joseph, 300, whatever pounds of him haul ass. And after the quarterback, um, for a dude that's, you know, joining the team halfway through the season, um, 35, 36, somewhere up there in age, um, giving that level effort. Um, I know I've heard um, Cover One talk about this a few times of like, do the same thing with Linval Joseph. You know, you're you're up there in age. You don't want to show up for mini camps and training camps and preseason and all that. You want to, you know, sit on the couch, keep yourself in football shape and join the team week eight, something like that. Week 10, make a playoff push, um, be a rotation guy, keep yourself fresh. Uh, I actually all for that plan. I don't know if they're ever saying that in jest, but every time I hear them talk about it, I'm like, yeah, do that. Um, you never know what's going to happen with injuries throughout the season and having that guy be able to pop up and rotate in all for that plan. Ed Oliver, real easy. Want to see more of the same from him. I um, think his last season, he kind of silenced a lot of doubters uh, when he got that extension. And I think he outplayed his contract um, by far his best year with the team. And, I just kind of want to see him continue to be paired up with somebody next to him that 
between the two of them, somebody's going to command the extra attention and one of the two of them is going to be making plays. Um, for so long, it was, we were talking about, this is going all the way back to Star, um, about Star staying healthy so Ed Oliver can do his thing working one-on-one. -on -one. I think this is the first year that we saw Ed Oliver and it didn't really matter who was next to him. He was making plays. Um, so bring back Daquan Jones. Give me somebody in the draft. Um, just give me some talent next to Ed Oliver. And I think that that contract is going to continue to ultimately kind of be a value contract. And finally with, Oh, we got two more. Um, Tim Settle. Another guy that I was really excited to bring in. I thought he looked great in Washington um, and his limited action. Thought last year was a better year for him, but overall, I feel like he's kind of been a disappointing free agent signing. Um, when we brought him in, I, I kind of felt like this was a guy that was just stuck behind a myriad of high picks, and all he needed was that chance to to crack, you know, a starting rotation, and he was going to blow up. Haven't seen that from him. Um, like I said, I think we did see some steps forward from him last year. Maybe you bring him back on on a cheap deal for, you know, the familiarity with the building, the system, all that. Um personally, this isn't one I'm I'm not gonna lose sleep over him if if he's gone. Um and then finally Jordan Phillips. Honestly, kind of about the same. I think Jordan Phillips was super impactful at times throughout the last two seasons when healthy. Um, I think he's also somebody that's dealt with a lot of injuries. Um, he's getting up there in age. And my biggest thing with Jordan Phillips is for, for his size, how often he can kind of get blown off the ball. Um, he does make some impactful plays, but the consistency is not really there for me. And, this is kind of right in the same vein of everything I said about Shaq Lawson. Um, I love the player that he's been with the Bills. I love that he went elsewhere, didn't have success, came back and had success again. Um, I think this is just a spot where it, it, it's time to time to get younger and cheaper there. Um, moving into the linebackers, um, left this for the tail end of the episode because I, I don't think there's a ton to talk about here. Um, have our two starters, obviously, in Matt Milano and Terrell Bernard. Uh, Matt Milano, not much to say on the 2023 season. We all know who Milano is. Um, I don't think this is an injury that's going to, you know, affect him long term. You know, it, it was just a long recovery time. Um, so I expect the same Matt Milano when he's back on the field. Um, Terrell Bernard, Obviously, a revelation in this building. Um, I won't speak for everybody, but I think a huge question mark going into last season um, was that middle linebacker position. And so much so that there was myself, I was mocking linebackers round one, um, round two. Um, there's just a ton of buzz for and worry, I guess, about, you know, replacing Tremaine Edmonds and, you know, not having a plan in the building. And this was kind of a, a reminder that Brandon Bean, Sean McDermott, Bill's Brass, they know more about football than I'll ever know. Um, even when they drafted Terrell Bernard, it was kind of like, why the hell are we drafting a Milano replacement when we have to look at replacing Edmonds? Um, Trell Bernard came in and played absolutely phenomenally. Um, can't wait to see what him and Milano look like together. Um, obviously didn't get to see a ton of that. And when we did, it was awesome. Um, behind them, we do have Dodson as a free agent. We have Tyler Medikavich as a free agent. And then rounding it out is Bale Inspector and Dorian Williams. Um, Dodson was a guy that I had 
kind of no interest in in seeing on the field last year, if I'm being honest. Um, just a guy that's been around the team for so long and was never really able to force the team's hand in giving him more playing time. Um, I feel like he made me eat a little bit of crow this past season. And, you know, the defense did have to kind of adjust how they play around him. Um, but I thought he he had a very solid year. Um I wouldn't mind having him back as um, as a depth guy in case of injury to either Milano or Bernard, just based on how he played in 2023. I think there's also a world where a team will see what he was able to do in 2023 and it kind of bet on him being a starter for them, a bridge for a younger guy, um, something like that, kind of in the role that, you know, maybe we envisioned for him here, not knowing if Bernard was going to be ready. Um, but I think if you can bring him back, it becomes like Dane Jackson for our cornerback room where you don't necessarily want to see him on the field, but if a guy or two goes down, you know, it, it kind of, keeps the floor a little bit higher. Um, and you know what you have in that guy. Um, Tyler Medikavich, he's he is who he is on this team. Um, he's been a long team special teamer. Um, I think what we see happen with Medikavich will kind of tell you how the team feels about some of these younger guys and what they can do on special teams. Um, Medikevich, I can go either way on. <clears throat> I'd be fine with bringing him back. I don't think he'll cost a ton. Um, and he does have a great impact on special teams. I am kind of looking at it from the perspective of, you know, we talked about getting younger and cheaper. I think some of these later round picks, these guys that are going to be rounding out the depth, I think we need to start seeing more contributions from them on special teams um, just so we can, you know, from a cost savings perspective, um, I'm all for paying some special teams guys. I think we can kind of get caught up in, you know, what money we're spending there and whatever um, special teams is still important and you, you need to be able to have a prote productive special teams unit we saw how frustrating it was when teams units struggled this year. Um, so if you got to give them a contract to maintain that floor of your special teams, I'm fine with that. Um, I would also like to see contributions from the younger guys. Um, so we don't have to continue paying those, those high end contracts, special teams wise. Um, then rounding it out with bail inspector and Dorian Williams. Um, going to lump these guys, two guys together because I, I feel similar to them. I um, think they're both young. We've seen limited snaps from them. Um, bail inspectors seem to be, you know, favored at times as the next guy in when injuries happened. And Lord knows they happened in the linebacker room this year. We saw pretty much everybody. Um, we even saw it. AJ Klein, you know, escape a family vacation to have, to play a couple of games with the Bills. Um, so I'm kind of excited for both of these guys' possible futures with the team. Um, I love Dorian Williams at times. I think he showed his athleticism and what he can be. Uh, I think he also showed some diagnosing instincts being off. And I think if you kind of clean that up a little bit, um, take away some of these full speed mistakes that he was making and, and use his athleticism and kind of work on his um, progress or like diagnosing his plays. Um, I think he could be, another absolute steal of a player as a third round linebacker that we didn't understand when he was picked. 
Um, so excited for both those guys. Um, these are two players that I'm looking for. How much can we get out of you on special teams? And, you know, are you the guys that can make Medikev a guy like Medikevich unnecessary? And then we can look at um, drafting a couple linebackers, um, adding some, you know, cheap veteran talent that can kind of round out that depth. Um, and then just wrapping up today, um, meant to do this at the top of the show, but here we are. Um, as we move towards free agency, a couple of transactions look like they're going to be coming down from the bills. Um, team expected to cut Naheem Hines and a trade with the Chicago bears for Ryan Bates, um, for a fifth round pick. Um, the Naheem Hines deal, I, I don't think was a big surprise. Um, and honestly, I wouldn't, I wouldn't rule out a possible return to the team. Um, I think this was kind of a situation like we've talked about. Team probably went to him or like, hey, would love to have you back, but we can't have you be a five million dollar cap hit this year. Um, why don't we, why don't we play with that a little bit? Um, maybe Heinz thought he could get more than they were offering him on on the open market. Um, I think kind of like a specialized player coming back from an ACL injury, getting another year older. Um, I don't think there's going to be a huge market for Heinz. Um, so maybe he's out there for a little bit and he's like, you know what? That wasn't so bad in Buffalo. I'll head back over there. Um, I do think that kind of boosts the odds that Deontay Hardy remains on the team. Um, we had talked about kind of the two of them and um my idea was being fine with one of them being back i didn't need both of them uh, especially at their price tags when they're mostly contributing on special teams um so we'll see what happens there um and then the trade for <clears throat> fifth round pick for ryan bates to the bears um i this is a move i'll start by saying i i don't like um, and this is just from, you know, an, uh, just from a player perspective, um, I don't think that for a team that's competing for it all right now, I don't think that you are going to replace the value of Ryan Bates in year one with a fifth round pick. Um, now there are parts of this move that I, I don't hate, um, <clears throat> I don't think this was a, a cap clearing move. I think this was kind of like a, a doing right by the player move in that, you know, maybe there was a conversation between Bates and the team of like, hey man, I've, I've been waiting in the weeds here, you know, being the Mitch Morse replacement. Mitch Morse is sticking around longer than we thought. I think I can start somewhere. Uh, I'm not going to demand a trade, but kind of asking for a trade here um, and the bills kind of gathering another, another pick for him. Um, <clears throat> something like $1 million in cap savings and a $4 million hit. <clears throat> so like financially, this isn't, you know, this, this great financial move that makes complete sense. And, uh, you know, it sucks that it was Bates, but, you know, we had to clear the cap somewhere. I, I think this was nothing more than than a move to do right by the player and give him options somewhere else. Um, now, getting the pick back, leave brings us up to a total of eleven picks in this draft, which is great, um, especially on on the front of getting younger and cheaper and needing to fill up depth as we have some of these bigger contracts we can't really work around and we want to extend our own guys all that stuff um i think we've seen with brandon bean that he gets antsy and he's going to go get the guys that he wants if he gets close um so i think it gives gives Bean a little bit more ammo in the draft to be able to move around and then the final thing with this is 
I see a lot of people out there saying, you know, feel like we could have got more for for Bates than a five. Um, not totally sure I agree with that. Just, you know, it's it's a depth offensive lineman. Maybe you could push it up to a four because Chicago might start him. I, I don't know. I, I think it's about appropriate value. And I think we inflated a little bit because that was our guy. Um, I think a lot of us have really grown to like Bates and it feels real good having that level of talent be your first guy off the bench that especially for your interior offensive line, but you know, has the potential to play all five spots. Um, I will say that Brandon Bean has been able to do a good amount with some of the late round picks. Um, when we're thinking about a guy like um, Christian Benford, um, some of the other picks that we've gotten later in the draft. I mean, even <clears throat> Gabe Davis, for what it's worth, a fourth round pick. Um, you know, a guy that most people want to let walk this year and kind of failed to live up to expectations as we moved him up to a number two receiver. But for a mid to late round guy, I feel like we've got we got great impact out of a player like that. Um so I'm not I'm not sleeping on a fifth round pick with Bean either. Um, I think we do need to be careful with the selections that we make in this draft because we've seen over the past few seasons um, teams like what the Bills are building in Buffalo, and you know the the sixth seventh round pick guys that are getting put on the practice squad. We've seen. Three, four of them get plucked over the last couple of years. Um, so it's great having the 11 picks. I am all for packaging up some picks and making maybe like seven selections of guys that you're pretty confident can find a path to the roster because um, uh, there's no point in making 11 selections if two, three, four of them are going to end up on somebody else's practice squad. Um yeah, and that's it. Um, so that's going to wrap it up tonight. Um, next week, we are going to take a look at the secondary, maybe get some special teams in there um, as we move closer and closer to free agency. And as you guys know, with free agency, I'm going to do my best to stay up to date on everything. Um, but without fail, every time I record throughout free agency, uh, I'll get done recording and head out of the house. And 30 minutes later, we'll add another player. Um, so just give me a little bit of grace as we move into free agency. Some stuff is going to, you know, feel like old news versus breaking news. Um, free agency is a whirlwind, um, but it's a really fun time of the year. Um, so make sure you're subscribed, tuning in every week. And we will talk about that as we move towards free agency and the draft. And as always, go Bills.